Welcome to CVM Stories, the podcast on customer value management. Together, we explore how companies can be more successful and the customers happier through the use of latest customer value management techniques. Learn key commercial and analytical insights from telecoms, retail, finance, and other industries that drive CVM forward. Welcome to another episode of CVM Stories, your gateway to customer value management and data-driven marketing in telecoms. I am Sharunas, your host. Today, we have a very special guest, Florian Schwartz, who is Program Lead for Data-Driven Marketing at A1 Telecom Austria. Florian has been at the forefront of customer value management and data-driven marketing for over a decade. In this episode, we will touch on several very important topics, such as customer centricity, churn, use of AI and ML in customer value management, KPIs, as well as experimentation. So let's dive in. CVM Stories is produced by Exacaster. We help companies take their customer value management to the next level. To stay updated on our latest episodes, subscribe to the podcast or sign up for an email newsletter at exacaster.com slash CVM Stories. Florian. Uh, welcome to Vilnius. Welcome to CVM Stories. Very nice to have you here. Hello. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So um, I know you come from uh, Austria and uh, A1. Could you describe for the listeners uh, a little bit uh, more about your role? What, what do you do? Mm-hmm. So I'm, as you said, in A1 Austria, A1 Telecom Austria, uh, which is part of Telecom Austria Group, um, a group of companies working in Central Eastern Europe. Um, I'm um, in Telecom Austria, uh, responsible for data-driven marketing. Okay, so very, very modern, uh, very cutting-edge occupation. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's definitely interesting uh, with a lot of learning, uh, but also a lot of things where we see it doesn't work as we initially thought it would work. So experimentation has become part of I would call it the DNA of what we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very nice. Before we go into a lot more detail on that, uh, can you describe for for listeners, how did you end up in this role? So, I mean, uh, data-driven marketing and and marketing itself, did you study it at school? How how your career progressed? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I can say marketing is in my heart. Okay. (laughs) Um, I studied international marketing um, and uh, before... uh, before A1, uh, I worked in automotive industry, had a short trip to consulting business. And for quite a while, I've been in Telecom Austria Group in, tif- in different marketing roles. So I came originally from the product marketing side, was mm-hmm. doing portfolios, portfolio design, tariffs. Uh, then I was heading uh, Macedonia, uh, marketing in a Macedonian subsidiary in Skopje for four years. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that role, uh, that role was very interesting overall because um, we had so many things introduced at that time. When I came there, uh, the company was only four years old, so uh, pretty greenfield. And uh, the main theme uh, we were working on was growth. Yeah. Uh, so when I joined it uh, there, CVM or customer base management, well, it started to exist. Let's call it like that. When you were studying marketing, was there any uh, talk or or thinking about such things as customer value management, customer base management? A little bit, Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say uh, it's an often uh, neglected uh, topic, Uh, Mm -hmm. especially um, at that time when I was studying marketing. uh, Digital uh, marketing was not yet a topic, so customer data uh, was not so easily available. Mm -hmm. And there were only a handful of industries with subscription services where there was some data that you could use for proper CVM, I would say. Okay, so uh, could you describe maybe your feeling when you come into a head of marketing role in Macedonia. Mm, of course. What, what what are you trying to do? So maybe someone is coming into this role uh, today watching this episode. What, what what did it feel like and what did you actually do? What were the first things? Mm. Now, actually, um, for me, it was quite interesting because I moved from the largest of our operations mm-hmm. in Austria to our smallest in Macedonia, uh, also from our oldest operation uh, that used to be a state monopolist uh, years ago mm-hmm. to an operation that was only four years old. So okay. the whole structure, huge difference, whole yeah. huge difference. Yeah. yeah. The people, uh, like, uh, I I moved there when I was 31, and I was older than the average employee, imagine. (laughs) Okay, yeah. (laughs) And uh, also the structures that were there in Austria, I had a whole team of uh, 20 people doing, I don't know, one topic, uh, whereas in Macedonia I had half a person doing it. 
So like everything is now all of a sudden hands-on. Yeah. Much, much more hands-on. Yeah. And uh, talking about CVM again, uh, in Austria at that time, there was, I, I cannot tell you how many, but um, more than 20, 30 people working in customer value management. And in Macedonia, when I joined, uh, it was one or mm -hmm. two persons. So in a sense, it was kind of uh, easy for you to bring a lot more experience, a lot more know-how from the bigger market. But could you tell us what were the surprises that you encountered where you had to change your approach? Uh, it was to br I could bring uh, topics from the big operation to Macedonia, mm -hmm. but I would say I could equally bring things back uh, mm -hmm. where we as Austrian operation could learn a lot, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to fast implementation of things or um, finding workarounds when you don't have the means to do it uh, yeah. 150%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I could definitely bring uh, in is uh, more... Uh, experience uh, into the topic of base management because uh, in Austria already at that time uh, we had a big base to deal with uh, whereas we didn't have that in Macedonia at that time. Mm -hmm. So was this something like one of the new topics that you immediately started working on? It was one of the first topics mm -hmm. I started working on because already when I joined it was visible that the inflow uh, of new customers um, was not could not so easily uh, totally overcompensate uh, churn that started at, yeah, at yeah, this yeah. time. Isn't it amazing to even imagine situation that there is an operator who is not paying attention to the outflow? But it was actually the case in many, many companies. Uh, as, as recently, maybe as five years ago, there were still operators um, struggling I, 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 with this. I find it normal and reasonable. Yeah. At, at that time, uh, when, I, when I joined... Uh, at that time it was VIP in Macedonia, I think it was reasonable to be like that mm -hmm. uh, because you have limited resources, you have uh, limited manpower uh, and uh, you have to prioritize. And, that and at the time when our market share was still uh, low, mm -hmm. uh, highest priority was to get in new customers. Yeah. But of course, you, what is most important, and that's a topic that uh, I'm dealing with at the moment as well, to find when is the right moment for a change. Mm -hmm. When you feel it, it might be too late already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that's a very interesting topic you bring in. Uh, could you describe the moment where you realize that CVM has a chance to create big value? Like, do you remember the day or the situation? Like, I don't know, looking at some charts and saying, oh my God, we have to fix this. Um, or was this more of like a gradual growing of awareness? Uh, I think it was a a, a gradual um, process when, mm -hmm. when, I, when I realized what we are doing, mm -hmm. like the activities we do in base management. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I did see the numbers like a slight increase in churn. Mm -hmm. And also uh, when you reach a certain size, uh, you become uh, more visible to competition uh, and they react to your market moves more. Yeah. And uh, when, of course, they react and uh, make more aggressive promotions, um, I see the impact on the grosset side. And at the same time, churn is not getting, getting down again. And then yeah. I have to start uh, bothering about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So did you think of a, like a business case where you said, OK, I, I want to fix this problem. I need some uh, people to work on this. Or did you just start doing it straight away? So did you expect some in impact? Did you calculate it? To be frank, I don't remember mm -hmm. anymore whether we calculated it. Uh, probably the finance guys have asked for something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was pretty convinced uh, because, um, like, I've seen the, uh, the same development in more major operations before. Mm -hmm. So it was obvious that at some time, yeah, uh, have this to would do be it. Needed. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it. It was not a question. And I think any company that has customer data and has reached a certain level of maturity mm -hmm. has to do proper base management. Mm -hmm. How how would you describe uh, CVM importance today in many of the markets with the base very much mature? You're talking about telco? Uh, yeah, about telco, yeah. Hmm? C it cannot be overestimated, right? Because um, like we are becoming uh, more and more commoditized. Um, the market is not growing. We are mostly working in geographically defined markets. So mm -hmm. there is a limit, upper limit of the market. Um, you cannot convert any uh, non-users to users anymore for our mm -hmm. core services. So in the end, uh, it's totally key to keep and develop your base. Mm -hmm. So kind of the marketing focus that was always on acquisition has basically completely transformed 
over the years, and now it's all about the base. It should be, but, yeah, it's, it should but, be. but, but it's often not the case yeah. because I think in still many heads, uh, and sometimes I would not exclude myself, uh, we, we think about marketing as making a nice TV advertising, uh, creating a new product and so on. It's the more known tool and maybe the easier to understand tool than mm -hmm. doing the nitty gritty of proper base management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I have several questions about uh, the still the older days, let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, I think still we see telecom struggling with churn problem. Mm -hmm. So if you are today coming into a marketing head position and the company has a churn problem, what would you actually do? Like top five things just so solving this problem? Um, most important for me would be to understand the churn reasons. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sounds easy, uh, but... Um, Not easy. <laughs> to, to do a proper analysis yeah. and understand the main drivers mm -hmm. and what, what can I do against it. Is it uh, that competition has better offers? Is it that the customers are not satisfied with my performance? Um, we are at the moment uh, working quite a bit with the topic... Uh, what is the custom expectation mm -hmm. and uh, what do I deliver? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe to give an example here, if uh, you have a network uh, that, uh, or if you have a product that should deliver 100 megabit, mm -hmm. um, it makes a difference whether the customer is watching TV on five screens mm -hmm. at the same time mm -hmm. or the customer is just reading the news. Uh, so uh, if our line then in the end doesn't deliver 100 megabits, but let's say 80, yeah. maybe the customer that reads the news has no problem. Yeah. Whereas the customer that watches TV does have a problem. Mm -hmm. So I would have to understand that. Uh, and uh, I would say um, really look into the data, ask the customer on one side, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, look into the data that you have. What can you uh, see? What are the reasons? One thing that is maybe not new is um, um, term prediction models. Um, still, uh, for me, the classical churn prediction models uh, are one level to generic still, and I would go one level deeper if I have the data available. Mm -hmm. I think this is a kind of churn is a classical customer value management problem, and once you touch it, the whole Pandora box opens because you started from data. And uh, it's actually quite hard to get all of the data that you want around the customers. Absolutely. So kind of you immediately hit the first uh, bottlenecks and you can assess is this high quality situation you're having in your in terms of customer data or not. So I think that's a very, very uh, good thing that, that you kind of highlighted this. And I think it, it really shows the importance of an analysis first in customer value management. Another thing I would definitely look at, mm -hmm. um, at least uh, in, in one of my steps in Macedonia, this was a... Uh, quite reasonable, uh, quite quite big problem is a rotational churn as well. Mm -hmm. Could you uh, define what it is? Mm -hmm. It is when a customer uh, uh, quits a contract just to sign up a new contract with okay. you again at, well, better conditions for the customer versus conditions for us as operator. Uh -huh. Uh, and um, on one hand, customers can do it by themselves if your promotions are designed in a way that uh, new customers are treated much better. But uh, there's also another source uh, which uh, we then found out uh, is uh, your own agents kind of abusing the system mm -hmm. because it's designed in a way that for them it's an advantage to sell a new contract. They get full provisions, whereas to keep an existing customer has uh, less uh, incentive for them. Yeah, yeah. So kind of the, there is several possible sources, either the customer or even could be your sales channel uh earning the commissions but not, can be not really of your portfolio, bringing in. can be the yeah. sales channel can be the yeah. customer yeah. himself so a couple of sources mm -hmm. okay that, i think that's a very annoying problem to have i would say and then uh, in terms of fixing so uh, i think the incentives yeah we can understand how to fix that but then what are the easy fixes and what are the hard fixes that you have seen for, for churn you mean yeah yeah um well an easy fix, but an expensive fix is um, the whole uh, a whole concept around uh, LMD, last minute defense and mm -hmm. uh, saves. Um, what, what does that? Uh, mm -hmm. How does that work? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. It means uh, when a customer wants to quit, um, uh -huh. um, you give them uh, special offers, yeah. better offers, yeah, mm -hmm. everything yeah. almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. In the end, yes, you can often keep the customer, but mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, uh, it costs you money and uh, it's not very exact yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Very late. Okay, so that's one. Um, maybe here a, a little detail about um, when I introduced uh, this uh, system in Macedonia. Um, people learn about how these mechanisms work. And here again, you could have customers kind of abusing it, but also, again, your agents, mm -hmm. uh, like telling the customer, uh, well, tell me you want to quit uh, and I can give you a better <laughs> offer. Yeah. So what uh, um, we introduced at that time um, was a randomizing element in the system mm -hmm. uh, that out of 100 customers, only 90 would get uh, a last minute defense offer okay. mm -hmm. and it was unpredictable which ones wouldn't and this was saved with the customer so okay. uh, it wouldn't so you help if you open it several times and yeah. uh, at some time you get it yeah. uh, what was the intention behind uh, for the agents to make it unpredictable so that they would not promise to the customer say you want to quit and I can give you a better offer because yeah, they yeah, wouldn't yeah. know whether they can yeah, yeah, yeah. so you, you basically had like centralized control over this discount set and then uh Use for this that. element, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think you cannot fully centralize uh, safes and last minute defense, yeah. uh, but uh, I mean, it depends uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on the creativity of your agents, depends on, on, yeah, yeah, on several yeah, yeah. factors where that pays off to do that. Yeah, yeah I think it's a very uh, nice uh, way you describe this uh, process. It, it's a quite common tactic, still widely used, I would say, probably by every subscription uh, uh, company. We do use yeah. it and, and it makes sense, yeah. uh, but ideally, and uh, now that's the more complex uh, to already catch these customers one uh, stage before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a very nice way of thinking, okay, well, we have plugged the hole, maybe the water stopped uh, coming in or stopped leaking. Now, how do we start preventing uh, churn? Exactly. And yeah. I think so, then we get to the concept of a customer journey. Yeah. Uh, and to analyze the certain, uh, the different stages of the customer mm -hmm. journey, and maybe at an earlier stage, find out where do we lose the customers. Mm -hmm. Is it a problem uh, with, as, as we said before, with, with the tariffs? Uh, is it a problem with the service levels and yeah, so yeah, on yeah. and so forth? So I think, yeah, that's that. That's a very, very nice way of kind of gradually arriving to where we are today with customer value management, right? So you start to look earlier and earlier all the way to onboarding and then before even onboarding, why are we even acquiring these bad customers that we can't serve? And Pretty soon you have uh, what is kind of state-of-the-art customer value management. And um, you remember before I said uh, that uh, trend prediction models, um, some of them are a bit too ba basic. Yeah. Maybe one example here. I would suppose uh, the most uh, important factor uh, of a trend prediction model often is uh, the contract binding. Uh -huh. I mean, that's a, it, it's important, but yeah. it's a, it's a no-brainer that a churn goes up when, uh, when the contract, contract, ends. Expi uh, yeah. contract expires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I think very, very, very nice. So that kind of describes us, gives us the longer-term perspective of how we arrived uh, where we are today. Maybe you can describe uh, how does customer value management feel today in, in, in Austria or in other, other markets that you have seen how does this work now? Um, it feels more complex. Mm -hmm. It feels more sophisticated. And what is most important, and that's um, hard to, to implement, um, customer value management used to be a, a separate function, like classical telco setup was. You have the product guys and you have uh, customer value management as a separate mm -hmm. unit. Uh but I believe these this silos need to open up more and more. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it doesn't work anymore so well that you define a product for new customers, throw it over the fence and then customer value management deals with the base to sell it to the base and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think the first big change uh, was um, the rise of digital channels. Mm -hmm. So you have different ways how to, to reach your customers and uh, you cannot separate so much anymore. Is this an existing customer? Is this a new customer? Both use our app, both use our website, mm -hmm. uh, our self-care uh, tools and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So definitely here we have a much wider set of customer contacts. Uh, mm -hmm. and, yeah. 
So kind of the concept of the product becomes a bit more blurry because there's channels that are being constantly used, but maybe there is no product that has been bought yet, but you are already in the contact with the customer. So I think that's yes, that's and, and, very, and the whole digital nice. mm -hmm. uh, sales funnel, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, like from a uh, unknown to a known but uh, not fully known cus non customer, mm -hmm. customer mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So it's not uh, it's like there's not a red line like in the past. It's not a non customer mm -hmm. versus customer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think this is a really nice uh, kind of example of change that happened over the years and really start to mix things up. Maybe you can tell a little bit also about the product marketing aspect of it because many operators organize around products. Maybe it is postpaid residential uh, with contracts or maybe prepaid. And historically, it worked. So what were the good things of this setup and what are the challenges now? You said historically it worked. Mm -hmm. I, I would even say it still works. Yeah. But there again, we're at the topic that I mentioned before, we might reach the point uh, when you don't yet feel it, but it's time for, for adapting things. Mm -hmm. um, and why I believe it has to be adapted if, if you want to be competitive in the future mm -hmm. is that the products as such, the classical telco products, become more and more exchangeable and more and more commodities. Mm -hmm. Like um, when, when I started working in telco, you could make a difference with on-net minutes, off-net minutes, how many SMSs, uh, how much data, do you include data or not, what phones out of the 200 available on the market. Mm -hmm. So it made a lot of difference. Um, yeah. uh, whether it was um, uh, tariffs with included minutes or with pay-per-use and so on. But, uh, but where are we now? I mean, uh, we have unlimited minutes. We have unlimited, well, SMS doesn't matter at all anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have data also reaching close to unlimited amounts. Mm -hmm. Devices, we see uh, the importance of devices gradually decreasing. Why? Uh, I mean, look at your phone, look at your previous phone. Uh, it looks the same, yeah. it does the yeah. same. Yeah. Maybe the biggest difference is that the battery works better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, the like we become more a, a commodity. Of course, we need to make sure that there are differences, mm -hmm. but the levels are, uh, are less. So I believe that gradually the importance mm -hmm. of uh, of how to treat the customer and how to offer things uh, while they are a customer mm -hmm. grows. That's why I believe it's not like uh, anymore the product, or it, it, it should be not anymore the product and then uh, uh, customer happy for the next years, but that you enter with the product and then you have um, you kind of complete your product during uh, the usage yeah, yeah, like yeah. try and buy you offer add-on quantities small upgrades here and there and that's why it's not a dichotomous um, approach anymore mm -hmm. even if it still works then yeah, so yeah, yeah, to yeah. return back yeah, yeah. Uh, because um, I think the, the pain only gradually starts now. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting angle that you bring. And if we take like the classical product attributes of like product itself, so it's the same as you said, the pricing, same or even no room and then promotions, everybody's doing the same thing and the distribution is done the same way or very similarly. You have pretty much exhausted the classical elements of the product and you now need to introduce something else. And uh, that's kind of the key, key challenge. I mean, we're still trying uh, yeah. also in Yvonne to, to find these elements on the product side as well. And it so, should so, probably so, never end. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so to, to, add, to, to add, for example, security services. Yeah. Uh, that's a topic that is very close to telco services that does work. Mm -hmm. uh, or um, we have been traditionally uh, famous for best network which we do emphasize, which we do yeah. play on. Yeah. But also here, people use Wi-Fi at home and so on. So best network is not uh, like in the past anymore, the antennas, yeah. but sometimes even the Wi-Fi. So what yeah. we're doing here is uh, Wi-Fi mesh systems for home. And here again, we're entering into what I said. Maybe you cannot sell all of this at first. Yeah. Maybe you first sell a connection and then with your analytics, you find out this customer has an issue with Wi-Fi coverage. Mm -hmm. uh, so all of my network perception goes down if I don't because offer a solution, of to that. exactly, yeah. I, I don't really control it, but yeah. I should know as an operator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these things are kind of uh, more and more growing into each other. Mm -hmm. So we are much more complex environment in terms of the product features as well. 
super, and super with complex. With this, you kind of answered your question yeah. about what is the benefit of this old system. Yeah. It's simpler. Yeah. You have clear task here, clear task there, KPI gross set, KPI uh, whatever churn yeah. or base uh, yeah. revenue development. Easy. Relatively yeah. easy to yeah. manage. Yeah. So could you describe then the situations where you start feeling that this is no longer working? Maybe in your own work or maybe in relation to channels or other uh, parts? Um, here again, I, I, I can say it's, it, it's a gradual thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mostly realized that in my current role with uh, data-driven marketing, mm -hmm. uh, um, what do we want to do is um, to sell um, the product that has the most, uh, or the, where the customer has most affinity mm -hmm. and that delivers the highest value for a one at any point of time. So mm -hmm. I would analyze that all the time. Yeah. Uh, But if I have uh, like this classical product approach, uh, mm -hmm. like I want to sell as many products as possible, I have a collision here of goals. Uh, like yeah. I cannot, uh, I, I know that this would be the best to sell to the customer, but I have the goals on something else. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's what is being pushed through. Or uh, when we're talking about um, uh, how to develop the base, it might be, it might have an opposed effect uh, if the product uh, development uh, runs into a different uh, direction. Mm -hmm. So sort of the data-driven aspect is by design looking from a customer point of view almost. Has to. And then, and then you end up with the, the rest of the organization has not caught up to this uh, perspective yet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We are working on that in a one group, mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, not an easy uh, transformation yeah, because I, I the whole um, target setting uh, would have to adapt uh, Also, as management, you lose certain influence on decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can relatively easily steer sales of a certain product. Mm -hmm. But it already gets a bit more complex if you want to put the customer in the center and say, I want revenue to be the guiding principle here or customer lifetime value. I mean, yeah, it's even, a wonderful concept, yeah. but, but uh, who can exactly measure customer lifetime value? Yeah. So kind of translating the high-level goals into medium, intermediate goals. It becomes And especially to break this challenge. down to goals for very operationalized goals for the agents on the front line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they understand a sale. Yeah. Uh, or they understand uh, one transaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But to, to how to explain to them, in this case, it's better not to sell anything because it long-term increases the value of this yeah, customer. Yeah, yeah. Could you describe the role of next best offer in this situation? Yeah. Uh, is it helpful? <laughs> <laughs> Tough question. Yeah. Um, in theory, it is. Mm -hmm. But here again, it depends a lot on how you define it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because next best offer could be very uh, short term or could be long term. So mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't say that. It still doesn't solve the whole problem. No, basically. it doesn't fully solve it. Yeah. And even next best offer can be not super customer centric mm -hmm. because when we return to the concept of customer lifetime value, yeah. um, it might be that the next best action is something that doesn't generate any short-term value. Yeah. But overall still, I mean, let's not, uh, let's not uh, lie about it. It's, it's a cool concept, uh, just you need to manage it properly. Mm -hmm. So kind of opens the door to a better approach, yes. but you still need to be careful that you execute it with the, all the nuances looking at the longer-term value. But my mm -hmm. experience... Um, um, It should be a combination of algorithms and uh, management decisions. Mm -hmm. Like I started with the approach to have uh, next best offer only defined by algorithms, mm -hmm. um, which is maybe better than having a next best offer just um, by, decisions. by chance or yeah. by, by, by decisions, yes. Um, but it doesn't depict the full picture. Mm -hmm. So I, I can uh, I can uh, make an algorithm decide this has the highest probability for the customer to take, this generates the highest value as the next decision. Mm -hmm. But the algorithm has a hard time to predict things in the longer term. So mm -hmm. what value should, uh, or how should I quantify it if the next best action is just to tell the customer Um, thank you for being our customer for long term. Do you have any problems with us? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe <laughs> it doesn't deliver any value right now, but yeah. maybe it is. It would be the next best step uh, with a customer that is not fully satisfied. You know mm -hmm. it by I don't know by NPS, for example. Yeah. To just ask them. Something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So not not very 
easily incorporatable into algorithms in this case? You can, but the question is, um, or maybe you can, I'm not sure whether you can, but maybe you can. But the question is, uh, does the investment into portraying everything in an algorithm pay off? Mm -hmm. Because at some time you reach uh, like Frankenstein algorithms yeah, 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 yeah. that nobody understands anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think this, this brings us to the point of uh, the use of algorithms mm -hmm. in customer value management. So I know you have been doing this for the past many years. Could you share us what were the learnings from this? What would be the tips for someone just mm -hmm. maybe at the beginning of this journey? Um, well, uh, maybe first uh, tip um, would be uh, if you're in a telco, make sure your data is correct. Okay. It's a challenge. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, and uh, all of us have legacy systems. If you're not yeah. a greenfield from the last five years, you have legacy systems, data on different sources with different uh, formats and so on and so forth. To bring these together to be more or less comparable and more or less with the same timestamp and so on and so forth mm -hmm. is key because if the data is wrong, uh, you, your, your algorithms will just give you funny decisions and mm -hmm. you wouldn't know why. Yeah, yeah. How big of, of a effort is that? It's a, it's a huge effort. Uh, and, like uh, months, half a year, years. years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like we, we built up um, like a customer 360 data lake, all of that, and that's years of projects. Mm -hmm. And also to bring this to state-of-the-art infrastructure, we are about to, to move these things into the cloud, uh, not to have everything on-premise to be more scalable and so on and so forth. So uh, kind and, of already uh, a big effort there just to get the basic inputs correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, because uh, seriously, uh, if if you start with the uh, with the algorithms, uh, like I'm talking now about algorithms for next best offers or mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for for offer uh, for offers that you make to to a base, yeah. If the data is not correct and the algorithm gives you uh, wrong suggestions, you lose buy-in of the whole organization. Mm -hmm. uh, they will uh, tell you like what you're doing here delivers worse results than we used to have before. Mm -hmm. Why should we? Yeah, okay. So that's first tip. Make sure the data is prepared, it's clean. M make sure the data is clean. As good as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Second tip would be uh, check with your management uh, how far they want to go and what mm -hmm. is their perspective. Uh, you can do certain things bottom-up. Uh, you can go to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, in the end... Um, it depends on management how much liberty uh, they give you to use algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you can mm -hmm. explain a little bit. Um, can give you a very yeah, simple example. example. Yeah. Um, suppose now you use a system that suggests the next best offer. That, of course, collides to a certain extent uh, if management wants uh, to say, in next month I want that many grosses or that many sales of a certain product. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, the it, algorithm is contradicting that basically. Algorithm is contradicting. So what yeah. does the agent do with it? Yeah. Does he follow the algorithm uh, like that suggests him something? Yeah. Or does he sell what he gets pressure for mm -hmm. from his manager? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, of course, you can um, also to a certain extent integrate this in algorithms, but you need to know upfront. Yeah. Okay. So very, very good tip. Avoid this conflicting signal from the top. Mm -hmm. It needs to go hand in hand, otherwise mm -hmm. you have confusion in the organization. Very valuable. What Th else? Third tip would be um, think of what, what you need to optimize and what is a scarce resource. Mm -hmm. um, if you have an abundance of something, there's not much to optimize. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's also why in a telco environment, I would... Um, I would say we, we don't have so many products uh, and we have relatively easy ways how to contact our customers as long as we are allowed to contact them. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be reflected in the algorithms because mm -hmm. the, the, um, the optimization impact for like uh, of uh, how which product to sell is of course more limited in such a context than if you have uh, like a retailer, a million of, uh, of items that you mm -hmm. can sell to the customer. I think so, it's a very nice uh, concept of scarcity that you bring to the table. Not many uh, people think about it this way. Could you describe what you think is scarce in the telecom environment? Uh, in, in the telecom environment, um, what is scarce? Good question. I mean, uh, in, in, in our case, definitely uh, the, 
Agent's time, for instance, on the phone is limited, I would say, for me. Agent's time definitely is cars. And what I would also say is uh, customer's attention to Mm -hmm. a certain extent. Uh, Mm -hmm. So um, where I believe what we need to more take a look at um, compared to to other industries, for example, with this million of references, is the whole time uh, timeliness of what to offer when Mm -hmm. uh, and how to develop that better. Because unlike a retailer, I don't have like this one contact where I can sell, Mm -hmm. but I have a constant contact with Mm -hmm. the customer. So it's more like what, when, rather than uh, like a total limitation, I only have one product to sell Mm -hmm. to the customer. So it's sort of in a very challenging situation because the the scarcity is almost the customer's willingness to buy in a sense. The willingness and the attention. And uh, and I think that's a a, a topic... um, where we, which we are maybe underestimating, and we're discussing it mm-hmm. a lot in in a one at the moment, uh, is um, how to stay relevant. Like I, I have a, a, a whole, I have many options to contact the customer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can offer him de facto everything uh, over the twenty four months of con- contract mm-hmm. binding. Mm-hmm. But should I? Or do I lose customers' interest at certain yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not like that. I don't have the possibility to contact them. Mm-hmm. But I do run the risk of customers not paying attention. Sort of you are in a station where selling something else can result in the loss of a customer. That's it, a very, it, it, it very can, strange it, situation to it be. It can, or that mm-hmm. I offer the customer something and uh, he doesn't bother, he doesn't mind, mm-hmm. but maybe uh, uh, because of this irrelevant product, yeah. uh, the next offer that would be relevant he just doesn't pay attention to it because uh, he's yeah, used yeah, to yeah. not getting relevant information from us. Or even maybe selling a small product that ruins the whole perception. Can, can, <laughs> can, be, yeah. can be. It's almost like, you know, enterprise uh, sales where you're saying like every project risks the whole account. Even it's a 1,000 euro project on a 100 million account, it still carries the risk of the full thing. So it's actually requiring very big responsibility. You're giving a very good analogy with mm-hmm. the enterprise market. I believe consumer market is getting more and more uh, things from enterprise market. Kind of start to make sense. Huh? Yeah, yeah in, the, uh-huh. in the past we couldn't handle them because of scale. Yeah. But at the, at the moment with all of the tools and all of the data, uh-huh. uh, we, we can uh, do things for a consumer market that in the past we only could do for enterprise market. So kind to of give example, more attention. More mm-hmm. attention, mm-hmm. customer segments, which we always had in the enterprise segment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also to, yeah, to, to see at the whole uh, tenure of the customer and, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So I believe this is definitely maybe on a smaller scale, mm-hmm. but moving to consumer markets uh, where you couldn't do that in the past. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think we touched on some super important tips for algorithmic customer value management. Is there anything else you would like to add? There is one uh, thing that I would definitely add. Um, take a look at uh, the role of humans in your organization. Mm-hmm. Take a look at the role of agents and sales agents, service agents in your organization and don't under, underestimate them. The best algorithm does not work if the agents don't see a use in it, mm-hmm. uh, if the agents uh, don't like it, if it supports, if it doesn't support their goals. Um, it's totally different if, you, if you're a digital-only company and you mm-hmm. only sell through digital channels. Then you're looking at the UX, UI of the channel and stuff like that. And yeah. you can control it till yeah. the end. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you sell uh, through a website, um, and you want, uh, I want to suggest you whatever the new uh, earplugs, whatsoever. Uh, it's exactly this product. Yeah. But if there's an agent in between, and you suggest earplugs, and the agent doesn't like the earplugs, he will s- still sell you a <laughs> loudspeaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you cannot fully control this. Yeah. In my opinion, this is if you have a, a well-trained uh, team of agents that are empowered, it doesn't work, and it shouldn't work. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's also um, a, a learning for us uh, that we had. Uh, we underestimated at the beginning when we introduced this system uh, the role of the agent, also the experience, the user experience of our systems for the agents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is something that is very commonly forgotten. And then you find at your own kind of harm because, oh, the numbers are bad. But you look at the agent system and the, the recommendation is nowhere to be seen. It's three screens deep. And you have they they don't just don't don't go there. Exactly, yeah. they wouldn't use yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Okay, very very nice. 
So yeah, I think uh, we touched the AI topic uh, as well. Maybe uh, we can uh, uh, circle uh, back a bit to the topic we started at the beginning in terms of measuring uh, customer value management. So measurement is a super important <laughs> part of large organizations. And uh, what is the current state of CVM KPI? So what is measured and, and what do you think about it? Challenging uh, because mm -hmm. um, we're moving away from the classical KPIs that we also measured against on the stock exchanges like revenues, like uh, subscribers. There is this RGU, you know. RGU, of <laughs> course. Yeah. Revenue generating unit, very impolite way to describe a customer. Yeah, But I, I doubt that it will disappear. So, yeah, yeah, it's um, just part of the financial frameworks. Yeah, I think uh, we will have to... Um, to complement these KPIs. Uh, mm -hmm. So th these ones, we will still need them, uh, but we will complement them uh, by, uh, and I separate them into lead and lag indicators. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, the lag indicators are usually the ones that are more reliable, but you get them, uh, especially for those actions, re relatively late and mm -hmm. too late to to steer the business. Mm -hmm. So I think soft indicators uh, become more and more important, such as uh, net promoter score, such as, um, KPIs around the usage of certain things, the like product usage adoption. Ex KPIs. Ex exactly, mm -hmm. all of that that kind of give you indications about mm -hmm. what might the customer do next or what causes a potential problem with the mm -hmm. customer. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, um, customer lifetime value. Yes, uh, wonderful. Uh, I, I like the concept. Uh, I'm still struggling. And if anyone uh, knows, please text me uh, how, how or, or write to me yeah. uh, how to solve it. Um, customer lifetime value uh, is nice, but it's extremely hard to, to measure because there's so many unknowns uh, over time. Mm -hmm. Like... Uh, how can I uh, define the value of something that a customer might do in two or three years? Yeah, it kind I, of I mean, combines two lagging indicators and becomes very, very slow No, I, I mean, especially yeah. now, look at the, at the environment now. Yeah. Who would have known two years ago the inflation rates yeah, that yeah, we have like now? Impossible, yeah, impossible, yeah. So um, I think we have to get close to this concept mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and better around this. Uh, but yes, we're still, we're still discussing ourselves uh, what we can yeah. use here to, to best determine that. Overall, um, I mean, I still like as a, as a lead indicator something about customer satisfaction, whether it's mm -hmm. a net promoter score or something else, uh, but it gives you a relatively early indication. Is there an issue that could translate into a problem, uh, mm -hmm. to a real problem or to, to bad numbers uh, a year or two later? Mm -hmm. And do you uh, measure or incorporate any internal process KPIs? So I don't know, like time to market for a campaign and things like that, just completely from another angle, from the internal efficiency, maybe? Um, we do, but not as hard-coded. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but definitely, we have more smaller campaigns now, and uh, that's uh, it's mm -hmm. key in the whole marketing automation setup uh, that these campaigns uh, can be delivered fast and relatively easy, because otherwise you would need a much bigger workforce, which mm -hmm. uh, is hard to, to incorporate at the moment. How much of a, uh, let's say, conflict do product KPIs bring into the table versus the customer kind of base management KPIs? Do this clash? And how would you reconcile in the ideal world? Now, yeah, sometimes they, they can clash. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, a product KPI, uh, maximum sellout could mean massive optimization in, 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 in the base afterwards. Mm -hmm. Or um, also product uh, KPIs uh, refer to the act of selling and what happens afterwards doesn't matter. So mm -hmm. it could lead to extreme costs that I have afterwards in maintaining that or um, uh, dissatisfaction later on uh, mm -hmm. just to get the quick time to market on the product side, for example. So kind of product brings the very outdated, the narrow KPI perspective potentially as a risk. Like the acquisition is so important often in products because they're new and they're trying to grow the base. But really, it's just a repetition of the whole story. Then look yeah, at retention, it, look at everything else. In, in their context, yeah. it, it, it makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. What I believe uh, here is a remedy that you have end-to-end -end responsibility for a customer segment, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it doesn't help you only to, to, to acquire the customer, but you have an interest afterwards. Also, that 
servicing is at low costs and uh, that you don't optimize your base and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it's gradually changing and I see it also in organization that uh, more and more the awareness grows. That, mm -hmm. that so you, you're bringing in this customer segment concept and I think uh, it's a very, uh, let's say, idealized direction of customer value management or you're managing certain segments and uh, have responsibility for that. Could you describe some I don't know, either vision that you have or uh, some companies maybe you, you follow as role models that you believe are going in the right direction there? Mm. Um, well, the idea is uh, that um, we don't have a one-size-fits-all uh, approach anymore. Like in the mm -hmm. early days of, uh, of, of uh, telecommunication, I mean, when we were monopolies, it was just one line. Either yeah. you take it or you leave no it. No choice. Yeah. Uh, and afterwards, maybe a portfolio of three tariffs and, and all good. Yeah? But in the more saturated markets, um, the, the, the needs change and uh, they differ uh, segment by segment. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what I have in mind as an ideal concept is a couple of segments, not too many, uh, and a certain kind of end-to-end -end responsibility uh, in the organization for these segments. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, it could be perfect to have 100 segments with little tiny differences and you can target them perfectly and even go to one-on-one -on -one and so on and so forth. But that comes at the price. Uh, yeah. You need to maintain it. Uh, you need uh, responsibilities for it. And most important, you need to be able to map your base with them. Uh, yeah. And here, for me, the ideal is the most sophisticated system uh, of segments I can get that I can still map uh, mm -hmm. with my base data. Could you give some examples of these segments that you would have in mind? I mean, uh, the, the classical and most straightforward are demographic segments, mm -hmm. such as youth, such as families, such as whatever, silver ages, mm -hmm. uh, uh, school kids mm -hmm. can be. Ideally, um, I would go a bit beyond into a bit of behavioral segmentation so mm -hmm. that you bring in, is someone using a service or is someone not using a service? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this, uh, when, when you bring in these very like vivid examples, we have seen operators try to launch similar products. Do you think they went far enough? Like there's a price plan for students or something like that, but is this enough to really... Did they do the, the, the job fully or was it just uh, I would be careful to give you a clear answer on that mm -hmm. because uh, without knowing the circumstances, I, I wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say um, there's a trade-off. Yeah? I mm -hmm. mean, if you want to have six different portfolios, uh, it might become inefficient for you. Yeah. Uh, so I think, and that depends on, on your market and on your organization, the sweet spot might lie somewhere different. Mm -hmm. But yes, definitely a portfolio as such is not enough for me. Yeah. I mean, just the youth portfolio and then everything else stays the same, in my opinion, doesn't make sense. But uh, maybe where to reach these customers, how to service these customers. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they don't want to come to a shop or maybe they don't have enough money to, uh, to buy a new device cash, uh, whereas someone who's uh, 50 years old settled uh, has different needs and different capabilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I would want is that the whole customer journey for a segment uh, is kind of done specifically. Yeah. And here, that's why, again, I think maybe three, four, five segments are good enough. Uh, because if you have to do dif two different customer journeys for 28 segments, uh, this might be impossible. overkill and not, yeah. not be efficient. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's a, uh, recently in another episode, we were talking with, about channels and how in reality people are used to some channel. And this becomes uh, pretty good. It links to demographics because we all have ideas and understanding that older people are more calling to the call center, going to the shop, Maybe not universal, but still uh, there is more uh, habit of using that channel. And if you look at, look at the young generation, maybe they're using all the digital channels and, I mean, never ever <laughs> going physically. And then someone in the middle, like myself, maybe using channels like email, which the young generation barely uses, if at all. Uh, so I there's believe, a yeah. clear clusters of like population behavior channels that you could be use to kind of design those uh, propositions. Yes, but I would also add the product uh, and proposition specifics. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in my opinion, it makes a big difference whether we're talking about a commodity product uh, like a prepaid SIM card or maybe mm -hmm. even a prepaid uh, uh, eSIM mm -hmm. compared to a fixed line in a household yeah, yeah, yeah. where there is not yet an infrastructure. Yeah, so that's another huge angle in terms of the whole product specifics and all the capabilities. Uh, absolutely, and yeah, I would yeah. suppose even uh, for young generation, mm -hmm. they would like to know... Uh, when will this agent come? What do I have to prepare? Will they drill holes and so on and so forth? So yeah. the level of interaction is higher. Uh, is higher. Yeah. That also defines uh, different customer journeys here and mm -hmm. different channels that you can use. So there is a fair amount of room for differentiating these propositions is basically what, what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, what I meant before. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the portfolios as such become more commoditized yeah? uh, or the, the, the product propositions, but how, mm -hmm. how you treat your customers uh, how you interact with your customers, uh, this this will definitely change. And mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very, yeah. very interesting. So yeah, I think we dug pretty deep into some uh, super important topics, maybe a bit on a, on a lighter uh, note before we wrap up. Um, I know you uh, visited Lithuanian sauna recently. Can you compare this to what is the Austrian sauna experience like? Um, you see, the, the, the customer experience definitely yeah. is a different one. <laughs> so does that give you a good differentiated value proposition? I believe that sauna providers made a geographical segmentation like uh -huh. Austrian sauna compared to Lithuanian <laughs> sauna. Yeah. And it, they, I think they analyzed that in Lithuania you have longer winters and more time for sauna. Oh, so uh, the session is longer? <laughs> so the session, the session yeah. is longer, but yes, definitely, I think it doesn't do any harm to Austrians to go beyond segmentation <laughs> every <laughs> once in a while. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, no, yeah. really joyful experience. Okay, happy to hear. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think as, as we wrap up, we have uh, several traditional questions. So let's, let's begin with the uh, proudest moment. So uh, I know everyone in CVM has this single experience where you really did something that was flying beyond, beyond all expectations. Could you share something that, that you remember from your career really standing out? I would maybe refer to something that is relatively recent mm -hmm. um, and not classical CBM, which was building up our digital experimentation program. Okay. Uh, because um, when I when I uh, joined in this role, um, there was uh, one person uh, doing the, the bit. Uh, I mean, of course, um, very well uh, with the setting uh, in the setting that this person had. Uh, but we built up a, a new setup. We we hired uh, someone who was professor at the university before. Uh, we uh, took someone who had a very extensive knowledge in the whole organization and of CVM uh, mm -hmm. and built up here a new framework, educated uh, the organization, um, made them use it. And uh, what I saw in this last uh, one and a half years, how experimentation became from something that was kind of for geeks, uh, became business as usual. And wow, yeah, that's that's a very, very important angle to CVM because many things you have to try on small scale and you can exactly. before going big and it's often forgotten. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as I said before, for many things we don't know mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's a big loss of resources if you try out everything yeah, um, yeah, yeah. on full base. And I mean, we talked about relevance before. Yeah. Um, of course, you 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 lose customers buying if you try out everything on everyone and there's, uh, again, something irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So better do it on a small did, base. Did you call it like that as experimentation program? Uh, because it's the uh, first time I hear that it's uh, communicated straight, yes. straight forward. Straight wow. digital mm -hmm. experimentation Very program. Nice. Mm -hmm. Super happy. Okay, so then moving on to the biggest embarrassment. <laughs> so yeah, like uh, we have many cases in CVM where uh, someone does not really realize the full impact they might have, like either big loss in a campaign or something that really backfires. But usually it's a very great learning for the future career. So please, if you could share something educational. Maybe I will again uh, give you a relatively recent example about uh, this data-driven marketing program. Um, when we rolled out a relatively early version of uh, our recommendation tool to the frontline agents uh -huh. and it didn't work properly. Mm -hmm. 
And I like got calls uh, all the time, like this is shit, this doesn't work. Uh, um, any the average phone agent is can do bad. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> emails popping up, wow. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, it really, really took us uh, a long time to get the buy-in back. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and that uh, I think I mentioned it before. Uh, to not forget about uh, humans there, and they are not willing to try out something at an early stage if their incentives. Uh, Uh, are totally different like they told me like I cannot spend uh, two minutes with a tool that doesn't work properly mm -hmm. uh, I have targets I cannot fulfill them yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, then we invested a, a lot of time into the whole user experience of the tool uh, we, we had a lot of discussion with them what uh, do you need in what uh, does not work for you uh, and uh, based on that we improved the whole mm -hmm. thing and relaunched it half a year or so later mm -hmm. So and kind of the, the 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 fixing process was really long and hard and took a lot of feedback to, to the get fixing them involved. Process, mm -hmm. And I would say the fixing process is still easier to fix mm -hmm. than the trust in the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Once That's you ruin the trust hard. in the yeah. system, it takes you so long to regain that mm -hmm. again. So like experimentation in the agent channels in shops is maybe not very good idea <laughs> you have to do there super are small case there are scale. limitations yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and i must tell you we even tried with a friendly user group uh, but yeah uh, but it uh, didn't capture everything uh it didn't capture everything because mm -hmm. some errors just came up uh, when we had massive rollout yeah, yeah, also yeah. the friendly users were friendly so yeah. they were more kind of i want to try this out anyway and yeah, yeah. there we really had to step back and um Mm -hmm. did do a lot of communication uh, incentives again to to get their buy-in back Yeah, so kind of rolling out in uh, real sales channels is a very, very responsible moment. Check 10 times with yeah, the learning. Yeah. And, and, and overall, yeah. uh, not to forget the human element. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think I can just, uh, I just have to underline it once again. We are very tempted now, algorithms do everything, data does everything and so on and so forth. As long as there's humans in the value chain. Everywhere still, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very, very, very good uh, example. Thank you for sharing. Welcome. In terms of uh, educational resources that have been inspiring for you, maybe you could share a, a book recommendation or a podcast or something that you're you're listening to, you're using for someone who wants to know more about this topic. Nothing specific that I would recommend you. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm following a couple of uh, LinkedIn uh, uh, posts, but not that there's there's one channel where I would say uh, mm -hmm. this is it. Uh, so I'm I'm reading a lot um, everywhere widely, basically. Uh, maybe uh, one thing that in the German markets is very interesting is a magazine called Brand 1, mm -hmm. um, which brings in a lot of creative approaches around marketing around mm -hmm. customers. Uh, this definitely is an inspiration but I, it's not like that there's one podcast so that I can recommend yeah. thank you very much so Florian it has been a great pleasure to have you here I think lots of uh, useful tips and uh, you're welcome see you in future thanks episodes, for the talk <laughs> thank you for listening to CVM Stories if you enjoyed the show please leave us a review you can also ask us a question about a particular customer value management challenge you have at work We will happily ask our experts to tackle your challenge in a future episode. 